I am Baroness Alora of the Wesley, and I'm from the Baroness of the Sleep. Got into the SCA because of the arts, and that's what I love to do, and somehow that seems to be not the thing I get to do the most. My entry is a painted tourney chest. I made it uh, for someone else, and I kind of did it with the theme of where uh, if a patron commissioned someone to do a painting or something, that they would put the arms of the patron into the painting or the, the person themselves. You only have so much space on your walls to hang pictures and scrolls and I was looking for um, practical useful items that I could paint and there was this tourney chest. It was really fun to do. There's a lot of detail in it and for some crazy reason, I love really small detail work in painting, embroidering, whatever. I learned not to use brush-on polyurethane coating. Temper paints, if you rub too much, tend to start spreading around. So um, I learned that quickly and fixed it. This was an illumination made as a blank for a scroll for a dear friend of mine, Fort Baronage. It's a 14, late 1400s Flemish style. Kind of the Renaissance influences were kind of starting to simmer a little bit. They began putting more realism into plants and the animals, and uh, there was a big focus on nature. Again, that was a, a, also a first. It was the first time I'd used watercolors. I'd always used acrylics or tempera or oils before, and uh, so I tried watercolors, and I'm in love with it. You can do anything. You can use one color, and you can do, you can do a whole picture with one color and make it light here and opaque there and transparent, and I, I love it. It's a great medium. I did a wood burning or pyrography baronial device on the barony of Sentinel's Keep's baronial thrones. We had new ones made a few years back. They're very beautiful in their simplicity and we didn't want too much on it, so decided on the burning in the device. Hopefully down the road sometime I'm going to uh, put some decoration down the arms, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever done it. I, so I practiced first. I, I didn't just grab the thrones and go crazy because that would have been a disaster. I found out I really, really like pyrography. It's don't put a finish on it before you try to burn it. We had the thrones commissioned by someone else uh, on the panel that I was going to do the pyrography. He put a finish on it rather than messing around with the thrones and sanding that down. I went ahead and burned through it and it took a lot longer and it was much more challenging to get the wood to burn exactly the same that you expected it to with that on it. My name is Praxa Tarna. I live in the Shire of Arrows Flight. I play quite a bit in the Barony of Luxalan. I'm a research freak. I actually hoard information. Well, I don't hoard it. I, I do give it away, but I certainly collect it. My cloth of honor, based on the two earliest pieces of extant patchwork we have, it's a pieced silk cloth that hangs behind an individual. The cloth of honor is intended to be placed behind someone just to kind of be behind them. It's been working great as a Zoom background lately. I made the cloth of honor actually, one, because I love patchwork, but I started as a challenge from the Ragged to Regal challenge that was done by um, Simone and Jana and Heidi and Tatiana who put together this really amazing challenge where you took recycled things and used them to create something entirely different. I really enjoyed the fact that I got to make patchwork that was in period and the number of people that really wanted to engage with it. The major thing that I would do differently, as I said, this was part of a Ragged to Regal challenge and I used um, some materials that were not as stable as they should be. I had some fraying and some bits of the cloth that just wanted to shred. I've gone through and done darning on those, and the original impregnated patchwork cushion does have darning on it, so obviously it was not only me who had this problem. I wrote a research paper because I am absolutely fascinated and kind of fixated, in fact, on 16th century pattern books that were published 
and the Venetian printing industry and how that shift in technology really changed certain things about embroidery, certain things about society, certain things about who's using art and how they're using it. I got to write a paper and do a presentation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as part of a, a symposium. It got me writing on this one little thing about um, tagliente and pattern transfer, pricking and pouncing. And we often say that that's how you transfer patterns. We don't have a lot of research on why that is. The only written example we have in the 16th century is in tagliente, and there was no English translation available. So I decided to do one, and I decided to talk about it. The thing I love about this project is I get to talk about model book. Uh, model book are, are my major thing. I made a Kamika based on a 1530 portrait. My big project this year, making a version of a portrait by Giulio Romano of Margarita Paleologos. It's got pleating and smocking and an embroidery, and I got to use a model book pattern on the embroidery. I got to try a different style because I normally do a lower cut style, but this one has a, a higher collar and is easily identifiable to a particular decade. It has weird interlacing and different styling. It's got giant sleeves that pull off the body and it doesn't fit the person in the portrait, but that's the style. I tried some different techniques I haven't done. I haven't done a lot of smocking. It was a lot simpler than I ever thought it would be. It's just time consuming and fiddly. I love the forearm of this. It's so incredibly comfortable to wear. My name is Marin Duber Baum. I am an excellency and I am from the barony of Arnhold in the kingdom of Artemisia. I have an unhealthy love for hats. So if you're looking at the 15th century funerary crown, it is an interpretation of two Burgundian funerary crowns that are extant. It is basically the combination of the two to make a piece that fits into SEA sumptuary tradition and can be worn just as a landed baroness. I made this item because I was stepping down as the Baroness of Arnhold and I needed a coronet for my regalia. I am also very interested in the 15th century and specifically the Burgundian culture. The overall product was a success for what I was going for as far as trying to combine the elements of multiple extant crowns. If I could do anything differently, I would ignore the SEA sumptuary laws. This is only because with the two and a half inch maximum that is allowed my station, I have a really hard time creating this same visual balance that is existent in extant crown. If you're looking at the brayette, it was actually created in 2017 for the current Baroness, that is Her Excellency Tegan's Baroness of Championship. She had asked for a codpiece championship and I had always wanted to try to make an armored codpiece or a brayette. So what you're looking at is my excuse to finally do something a little bit more avant-garde. The design on the brayette is a weasel's face. The reason I decided to include that on my brayette is it is a uh, part of my arm. My, my personal heraldry is a rampant weasel fighting a rampant cockatrice. I wanted something that kind of encapsulated that viciousness. I really enjoyed learning how to do repose, and this item was my first. It was really fun to be able to do it with a symbol that I adore. I actually want to continue working on this piece. I would really like to set some jewels in the eyes so it has kind of the look of a zibulini, but not any of the, the fanciness that goes with it. <laughs> So if you're looking at the shoes, they're an interesting item as far as entering them in the competition, being that they are more of an experiment than a true reproduction of a piece. They are made using non-period methods, but I think they make a fairly passable result. I decided to make these shoes because I couldn't find any more. My main seller of shoes had gone out of business, and when I was trying to find shoes online, they weren't very period looking and they were really expensive. So I decided if I was going to go through disposable shoes, I might as well make shoes that are disposable. What I really liked about this project was the fact that I had a chance to just wing it and kind of let go. I have a tendency to overthink things and this was one of the first projects that I was just able to have fun with. When I made these shoes, I gave up on putting in the poulain, which is the part that I really want, the long 
long pointy toe. Um, when I was trying to test them, I just couldn't get my stride right to make those work. So if I'm going to make these again, I would like to make myself wear those two lanes and have the long pointy toe that was so fashionable in the 15th century. My name is Sven Brajnikov. I live in Artemisia Crown Lands of Rupert, Idaho. I'm working on a 16th century Muscovian Russian persona. Do you like my hat? I've made a hand-stitched replica Boxton Man tunic from 13th century Sweden, and I added a neck facing and trim. I took a hood to the Queen's Prize, and when I was there, Duke Sean showed me his hand-stitched Boxton Man tunic, and that was when I knew I wanted to make one for the Kingdom Arts and Sciences. I love that I was able to use the gifts of fabric and trim that I got from the Queen's Prize to make this project and it cost me only three dollars for the thread and i like the side seams are pretty good too i did a mock-up if you're gonna do anything with costuming i'd really recommend that you analyze your mock-up to learn as much as possible from it a couple of things differently from my mock-up to the project but i would have fixed the shoulder fit a little better i'm kind of shaped like a potato so i would have done the more a shape instead of the rectangular shape it's a pine six-board chest based on the construction of the Voxtorp church chest, minus all the metalwork. I made this because I've been interested in woodworking for some time, but I haven't really made it a priority until now. I have a bunch of power tools, but this is my first hand tool only project, and I wanted to start with something kind of straightforward. So I like the Voxtorp church chest rectangular design that doesn't use any complicated angles. I love that it's the perfect height for sitting on and I look forward to taking it to events. On the next box I make, I wanna try the through tenon design and I look forward to forging some hinges. Leather pouch I made is inspired by 13th century Persian example and I added some Celtic knotwork. So I've done some leather working in the past, but I really wanted to push myself on this project this is my first finished product with hand tooling art. So I was trying to decide whether I was going to remake it using the better tools that I got after my first attempt. And I'm so glad I did because the second one came out much better than the first. One. The leather needs to be wetter than I thought and there's no substitute for good hand tools. My first iteration, I used inferior tools and the leather was not super suitable for this project and I got some better tools and better suited leather and the second one is just great. My name is Jana at Hill and I am from the Shire of Cote de Ciel. This is my miniaturized version of the bed curtains designed and embroidered by Mary Queen of Scots and her buddy while she was imprisoned and they're really interesting because some of them have like secret metaphors. Like there's a lot of birds which people say are because she wanted freedom to fly away and there is a dolphin jumping over a crown which is a amusing pun because of course she was married to the king of france who was the dolphin there's a very cranky angry unpleasant looking ginger cat that's toying with a little cute little gray mouse and of course elizabeth the first was famously a ginger. Oh, so I made this item because I was making this dollhouse and I really wanted to be extra. What I liked about this project was that I really got over my fear of counted work because I really been afraid of counted work before, but I just loved it so much that I wanted to really have a go at it and I improved a lot over the course. This is my Tudor wrap gown that's made of wool and silk. It would have been lined with fur, but it's really hot here. So it's lined in silk and there's just enough wool on the sides, fold wool, so it's nice and fuzzy to make it look like it's lined with furriness, but it's not inside, which is a sari that I repurposed. I made this dress because I was gifted this beautiful lightweight blue wool. I was thinking of something to do with it. And I was looking at all my inspiration pictures and I saw the Tudor wrap and I thought, yes. And the fabric spoke to me and said, this is what I need to be. What I loved about this project was just how comfortable this is. It's a bathrobe, honestly. It's a little bit tricky to walk around in because it's, I made it historically 
a little bit longer so it drape over my feet and there's long sleeves. Next time, I would err in the favor of non-hysterosity and make it a little bit shorter so that I could walk easily in it without having to gather it up in my hands all the time. Historically accurate, but practically a little bit tricky. This is my cast -isle soap, and it would have been made in the region of Castile in Spain. It is notable because it's made from 100% olive oil instead of any animal fats, which makes it really, really nice. It's very smooth. It's even good for shaving. My husband's been using it for shaving. I would recommend making this out of like junk olive oil. I made this because I got a whole bunch of rancid extra virgin olive oil at a discount. In historical fashion, I thought, I just don't want to throw away all this olive oil. I will make something out of it. And so I made the soap and it worked beautifully. What I liked about it was that it's really fun watching the fat go from fat to soap. Just watching that chemical process is really really entertaining. What I learned was that you should always wear eye protection the entire process. Not just when you're pouring the lye in, but while you're stirring it around and saponifying the oil into soap, wear eye protection. It was fine. However, when I posted pictures to soap making groups, they said, no, and freaked out. That's dangerous. In future, safety first. My name is Angus Ulfer, and I'm from the Barony of Ornholm. I'm from Scotland originally, and my focus tends to be on persona development. For the Norse spearhead, I decided I wanted to do a small piece of dodging. The kind of thing that my persona might have been helping out with on the lands that they're in control of. And so it seemed like the kind of small project that they might put their hands to, and it would be something they actually used. Part of why I focused on the spearhead was because a lot of the forging that my persona would be helping out with would generally be just fixing tools that were broken, that kind of thing. The last piece that you do after you've made the actual head of the spear is form the socket. You form basically a set of wings and then you use a mandrel, which is just like a piece of metal sticking out of your anvil, to turn those wings around it and form the socket and then use the heat of the forge to forge weld things together. If I had to do over again, I think the one thing I would really work on doing differently is making sure that I have a really good solid and thick forge weld at the top of the socket where it joins to the spear. The Liar Project, this is actually the third iteration of a period plausible Hebridean North style Liar. Obviously, because lyres are made of wood, there's no, always a ton of them that survives on the archaeological record, so we have to make a lot of guesses. And I'm on my third iteration because each time I do it, I learn more and figure out what I need to change so that the next one's going to work a little bit. I've managed to really dial in on a size of lyre that is going to fit well for my comfort when I'm actually standing or sitting playing it. But I've also figured out how to do that in a way that it's still fairly loud and resonant. I think the main change I would make is that I would steer clear of uh, nailing the body together instead of just gluing it, which is what I've done on previous liars. I decided to nail it together just because there had been a few liar finds that did have nails all around the corners of the body, and I thought it would be fun to give that a shot. The goat hide was an interesting item because it was something I planned to do eventually someday in the future when I was able to hunt a deer or raise some animals. And I sort of accidentally found myself in a circumstance where I was going to be tracking down, killing, and taking home a goat. With all the research I've done on the fee folding that my persona would be taking part in, a large part of what they would be doing was processing the meat and the hides from their animals. I was just really happy with how it turned out. It was one of the projects that I was going into the most blind as far as projects I've taken on. If I were to do it again, hopefully I would be doing it in a situation where I'd had time to plan it out beforehand and get everything ready. Um, and honestly, one of the big changes I would make is that I would make sure I had a little bit more time. I am Mayura Bhatranya, and I am from Arnhold. This is a performance of Planty Sunt Kaeli with an oboe and a viola da gamba. The piece was written by Antonin Divitus in the 16th century in Germany.
and was originally a church hymn. I entered this piece because I had started playing the oboe a little less than a year ago, and my parents said that it would be cool if I entered an oboe piece into the arts and sciences competition. Something I liked about this piece was that it tested my skills as um, an oboist, and it put me through my paces, it showed me a few new tricks, but it was also a little difficult towards the end. I wish I had more more stamina in playing the oboe. Well, when I run out of stamina playing the oboe, my lips get really tight and, and, and I can't put my lips on the reed anymore. They just won't stay tight. My name is the Honorable Lady Christina de Brescia, and I am from the Barony of 1000 Eyes, brand new to the kingdom. We just moved up here in January. It's a 16th century men's doublet. It's from a portrait of the tailor from an Italian painting. I wanted to make a doublet for my husband. He's a big guy, so it appeared to be a doublet that would fit his physique properly. I did like the fact that the bottom is two pieces instead of the tabs as a typical English doublet. So the Italian doublet is a little different that way. I would probably make the tails in the back a little longer so they crossed over a little bit so that it didn't draw up quite as high when he sat down. These are arrows that I made with the help of a, an arrow making friend that are based off the period arrows found on the shipwreck of the Mary Rose. I decided to make these because I am interested in archery and I wanted to make my own weaponry. The, the fact that I was able to make them with my own hand and my own design and my own creativity. What I would do differently is I would make the knocks more period. I used a plastic knock because that's what I had available to me and I'm not a very skilled carpenter so I would keep practicing until I could make a more period knock. You are looking at my sand kit for making Turkish coffee in the heated sand. Uh, it's a kit that I received from a vendor directly from Turkey. Oh, when I get together with the judges, I'm going to make them each a cup of Turkish coffee with the heated sand at the time. I decided to do Turkish coffee because coffee is a passion of mine. The history, the flavor, how it's advanced into modern day society and how it's become such a fixture in families. I think my favorite thing about making Turkish coffee is being able to share my passion and you know, being able to converse with people about coffee and the history of coffee and just the experience that goes along with coffee. There's, there's a whole lot of ceremony that goes with it over different cultures. Oh, I wish I knew not to boil it so hard. Typical coffee in the modern sense, you you boil the heck out of it to make it hot. With Turkish coffee, you do up to a slow little boil. Otherwise, it gets really bitter and nobody likes bitter coffee. My name is Vigdis Jan's daughter, and I am in the barony of Sentinel's Keep, which is in northern Montana. I got into the SCA because I was fascinated by illumination and artwork. Within a year of joining, I was doing fiber art, so I'm not quite sure how that turned out. Uh, my entry is a forecloth or a Norse panel for the front of your apron dress. And it would be in the front where everybody would see all your bling and your happiness. I loved to embroider. I learned a few other little fiber techniques to put on it. Well, I did do a little tablet weaving or card weaving, and then I did do some applique. I have a couple pieces of wool. I applique them, well, actually I embroidered them first, and then applique them on. Um, I also have set cords. I have them along the top of the apron, and I make the loops where I hook them to my um, brooches. My garb is all natural colors, so I've never been, like, uh, really bright. One day I decided I needed to bring something bright in, so red became my focal color. And I just started working around that. Every step seemed like you learned something. My next entry was 
now binded mittens. It is something that I picked up since I joined the SCA and really ended up liking it quite well. What I don't like about the, the ones that they have found, they look big and blocky and I, I call them ham-handed. So I tried to use a softer, finer wool red because I'm doing the red thing. I fit them to my hand as I went. The hardest thing is to make a match and so you almost need to work as you go along. I was looking at a whole, the idea of a whole set of clothing, all of the items that you would wear and, and have for your new outfit. So I thought I'd need a hat, I need gloves, I need socks, like everything you needed to take to the afterlife, whether it was cold or whether it was warm or whether you needed to be fancy. That was kind of how I based the whole project. I'm Lordship Dirk Jaeger. I live right on the border between Aeroslite and Loch Solon, so I kind of play in both. I guess I have this dual citizenship thing going on. I was recommended when I first started doing calligraphy. I started with a hand that was very early in period, and so I was told to look at illumination that would go along with that, and someone recommended that I look at the Lindisfarne Gospels. And one of the fancy, completely illum full-page illuminations from the Lindisfarne Gospels is the series of pillars. That needs to be a golden pillar scroll. I just made it because I needed the practice with the calligraphy and the illumination. Something about the project that I decided to do very late on was actually to throw these griffins up on the top of the pillars, and I think they add a ton. One of the big lessons I learned was plotting out how I was going to do this, and I ran out of space twice. So I eventually decided I either needed to make my writing smaller, or I had to get bigger paper. With this case, I went for a bigger paper. When I was first started doing illumination, when I was shown like, well, what kind of designs do you want to do? I was handed a book of just illumination designs. And a lot of them have these giant letters on gold backgrounds. And I thought, these things are gorgeous. So I want to get more into that. And I found a lot of those from the 14th century. So I went, okay, I want to experiment with that some more. Let's do a scroll blank inspired by a lot of those 14th century designs. I just need to, I need the practice, especially doing the white work. I switched hands for this one. I recently been working with Mistress Kaz on Gothic Texture Quadrata, and I already like that hand way more than the first hand I started doing. My white work came out really watery, so I need to do a little more practice on that. My name is Sophia Ivers' daughter, and I reside in the barony of Bronxhelm. Uh, my persona is based on a Danish rapier swordswoman of the late 16th century. I'm a follower of Salvatore Fabrice, who is also a teacher of King Christian IV in Denmark. My entry is in a 16th century Italian gown, uh, underskirt, partlet, and chemise. It's based on a painting portrait of a lady with a book done in 1560. Oh, I wanted to do an Italian gown forever, but it is a very daunting project if you don't really know what you're doing. Based on my rapier, on getting a rapier on and off the field, it wasn't a real practical costume, but with COVID-19 and digging through my fabric stash, the timing just came together. I learned a lot about Italian. I learned about partlets. I learned about boning or not to bone. Um, it was just a great project to work on. If I were to do it differently, my chemise would be more of the supportive garment rather than the boning in the bodice. These stockings are a woolen pair of cream stockings based about 15th century. There was a little ice age in Europe. Stockings were definitely a staple. Everybody had to have stockings. And I'm an avid knitter, and it was just a great project, practical project to work on. It fell right into my knitting skills. A lot of documentation pre-17th century that I could find on knitting, even though knitting was well known, but due to the fabric, there aren't a lot of early examples of knitted stockings. Another thing I learned was the purl stitch, which is the reverse of the knit stitch, really didn't come around till later. So one of the challenges in doing these stockings was to uh, use primarily a knit stitch, which, which I worked in the round, which was the primary method of knitting. The Master of Devent scroll for Master Albion Robinson's Elevation, which was in 2019. It's based on Gerard Tabalt's Academy of the Sword. 
book. Gerard Tumult was a Dutch man by origin, and he moved to Spain to learn the Spanish method of rapier. And I chose that because Master Albion is an ardent follower of the Spanish style of rapier. Master, I was a cadet to Master Albion, and when he was put on vigil, I asked to do the scroll because I just really wanted to do a do a scroll for him for his elevation. My background's kind of a technical artist and I took some fine arts in high school. So I really had to dust off those cobwebs, you know, remembering how to do perspective drawing and and uh, shading and things like that. Um, the trees were the most difficult part. It sounds funny, but when that, my first pass at doing the trees in that, that scroll, they looked like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. The trees just weren't coming together for me. And, uh, but I, I just flogged through it, the shading, and, and it finally did come together. And it was also my first attempt at um, gold leaf. My name is Amelia Hill, and I'm from the Shire of Cotesia. My entry is a couple of pieces from lace. This is bobbing lace, and there are these pieces of wood that are shaped so that they can hold string. You weave it together using pins to keep the nice little holes, otherwise it would be really solid. This is the most complicated piece on here. These two are from a kit. They are wristbands. I have two fish and a bookmark. I learned popping lace from my grandma. It looked fun. I really wanted to try it, so I did, and I really liked it. I'd like to learn how to do, like, tablecloths, like decorative tablecloths, and things like that in the future. I'd like to teach it to either my kids or my grandkids to keep the family tradition going because my grandma learned it from her grandma. I am Serafina Rose from the Barony of Arnhold. I've lived and played in four different kingdoms. I made a box loom, which would be used to weave a band for trim or as a strap. I used modern tools like a bandsaw and a belt sander and a drill press. I hated every second of it. Because my original plan was to make the loom, weave a thing on the loom, and do wood burning on the loom and make it three individual entries as one. I enjoyed the wood burning aspect of making that loom. If I were to do it again, I would definitely make the heddle as multiple pieces and not one because that was a pain in the butt. And I also learned not to take on a project this big with, you know, three toddlers in a pandemic. I made a blackwork embroidered blue flower on a square of linen. It could be used as a mug cover or decoration for a garment. I made it because I actually really enjoy black work and that it's portable so I can take it places. I really like how perfectly it came out. It was a lot of fun. I made a multicolored woven band that could be used as trim or as a strap. I made it with those colors because it looked really cool and it was very LGBTQ friendly. I really like the repetition of the weaving of back and forth. I don't have to use a lot of brain power.